All right, it's showtime. Chapter 22, Inferential Data Analysis, Part 1. This is from Ruben and Babby's Research Methods for Social Work, 8th edition. In this slide 2, in this edition, in this podcast, I'm going to briefly, and I hope I mean briefly, go over a few basic things that you need to know about quantitative research analysis, i.e., the dreaded S word. Yes, folks, I'm going to be talking about statistics, but just barely. Lucky you guys, you get a whole semester chock full of statistics next semester. Slide 3. Almost always when we make assertions about causal relationships that we find in our data, it is because we expected to find that relationship there. Or we may find something in an area of our data that we knew was going to be interesting even if our data did not support our expectations. This is where the role of theory uh, comes in handy. We support making assertions about causal processes in our um, data through the use of inferential statistics. And that is simply the various measures we gather that we then run through the meat grinder of our statistical analysis programs that we obtain the result from. No, Dorothy, statistics are not magic. It is just uh, knowing which lever to pull and which dial to read. Slide 4. I realize that many of you have been deprived of a statistical education up to this point. But those of you who have had statistics courses in the past or have taken multiple research courses in your undergrad, all of this might seem like old news to you. Maybe you can go get a cup of coffee. When we hear people talking about research projects <clears throat> or they are quoting articles, we see a lot of this on the news. They are often throwing out the term statistical significance. Sometimes you'll hear a newscaster actually ask the scientist something like, well, but what does that really mean? And then as the scientist explains it using statistics, the newscaster begins to glaze over. <clears throat> Hopefully I will be able to take it piece by piece and you'll be able to get it. It is an important thing to start to understand statistical significance and the concept of chance as it is the base of the whole pyramid of understanding uh, of <clears throat> of inferential statistics. The role that statistical analysis of quantitative data plays in our research is there because of our inability to conduct perfect sampling. Because it is impossible to select a sample that per perfectly represents our population, we have researchers have recognized that in order to move forward on any research we must be able to accept a little risk. And that risk is that the assertions that we make based on our statistical analysis are in fact incorrect. This risk happens because our sample will potentially differ enough or at least a little from the general uh, uh, population. 
And remember, when I am using the term sample, what I mean is those persons that we have selected to include in our study. Slide 5. When we say in the report of our findings that our intervention was successful and it was statistically significant at 0.05 level, what we're saying is that there is a 5% chance that we're wrong. Now, if you were a betting person and you knew that 95 times out of 100 you would win your bet, you would bet. Now that 95 times out of 100 would be the probability. And you're saying, wait a minute, 95 is not between 0 and 1. That's true. But when you divide 95 by 100, you get 0.95. And that is between 0 and 1. Slide 6. Statistical significance is based on probability theory. And probability theory, as it relates to sampling, contends that as you sample increasingly large numbers of individuals, your sample will begin to look more and more like the true population. Sometimes it's called the actual population. We have an actual population and we have a sample population because we usually lack sufficient resources to actually include every single person in our research. The U.S. Census attempts to do that every 10 years, but even they fail to collect information on everybody. Have you ever wondered why in research courses, they're always talking about decks of cards, or flipping coins, or rolling dice, hmm, etc. They use these as a way of providing um, metaphors to help in the understanding uh, of probability theory. And <clears throat> it is my belief that statistics emerged out of gambling. And next year you'll discover that many of the statistical tests that we enjoy today came about due to the brewing of beer. So, okay, that's my teaser for today. You'll have to come back in the spring for an answer to that one. Slides. In this chart, in slide 7, we are looking at a theoretical sampling distribution. This distribution is based on a deck of cards. The typical deck of cards used to play poker or blackjack has 52 cards, divided into four suits of 13 each. Two of the suits, spades and clubs, are typically colored black, and the other two suits, hearts and diamonds, are typically red in color. If I had a brand new deck of cards that had never been shuffled and I dealt them out into two piles, I would get an equal number of red and black cards in each pile. That is because when a deck of cards comes in a new pack, they're organized in order. So what would we get? So what we would get would be a 13 to 13 ratio in pile 1 and a 13 to 13 ratio in pile 2. So just like we want to draw a random sample from the entire population, if we wanted to only sample half of those cards, and we wanted each card to have an equal chance of being in our sample, we would have to do some sort of randomization process. Card dealers do this many times a night. It's called shuffling. 
So when we shuffle cards, we are simply organizing them in a random order. In fact, if you wanted to use cards as your random selection device, you could assign each person in your study a different card. So your respondent number one would be the ace of spades, and number two would be the number two of spades, and number three would be the number three of spades, etc. Then you shuffle your cards and draw cards until you have selected how many people, however many people you want in your sample. Simple enough. Of course, this method would only work if you had a total population of 52 or less that you were sampling from. And, you know, it, it's a whole lot more work than doing it uh, doing it that way than uh, just using Excel. So, referring back to our table, we see in the central column that if we were to draw just 26 of the of the 52 cards, that our probability of drawing an equal number of black cards as we have of red cards is 0.218 or just about 22 percent of the time we'll get that result. Now if we have set our statistical significance level at 0 0.05 which would be in the cumulative probability column on the far right, we could see that it would take a ratio of 18 to 8 of one color of card to the other before we could say that our results did not happen by chance. So say for example that you believe that you have magic powers that will cause somebody to draw more red cards than they do black cards. If you set your probability at 0.05 they would have to draw 18 cards that are red before we would say that your mental powers of persuasion were actually true. And of course, you would have to repeat this with a number of people before I would be convinced, say about a hundred people. Slide eight. A cutoff set at 0.05 means that those findings that lie within the zone outside the pre-selected cutoff <clears throat> make up the critical region of the sampling distribution. In the card example, this would mean that no more than eight recidivists are in one group and at least 18 or in the other. The recidivists are the, the black cards and the um, the other one would be the red cards. Um, the cutoff point may be set at one end of the theoretical distribution or at both ends. Generally speaking many social scientists recommend using two-tailed test even when the um, hypothesis is directional. Slide 9. In this example the significance level or the cutoff point set at point is set at point uh, 05. But the critical region is evenly split between both tails of the distribution with 2% of the critical region in each tail. This is the approach that is used for non-directional hypotheses. 
In the card exa example, we would be interested in both positive and negative outcomes. We would want to know whether or not the intervention has worked or not, or made things worse. Slide 10. This is an example of a one-tailed test. If we were only interested in learning whether or not the intervention was successful or not, this type of test would be appropriate. However, if the intervention in fact is harmful, this test would not provide any information about that potential finding. Slide 11. This is another area of the understanding of statistics that often brings with it some confusion or misunderstanding. Just exactly what is a null hypothesis? It means that we are hypothesizing that there is no difference. Oftentimes it does not seem very intuitive that we would use the null hypothesis. But when we think back to those two images that we just saw in the previous two slides, when we say that our results are significant at a 0.05 level, what we are really saying would be that we get these results 95 times out of 100. And that is the level of risk we are willing to take. So we were, when we run our statistical test and we get a significant finding at or below the level that we set, usually 0.05, then we should reject the null hypothesis, saying there is actually a difference between these groups. Next semester we will deal with both the null hypothesis and we will have something called a research hypothesis. I sometimes wonder why we didn't just focus on the research hypothesis only. Slide 12. Even more crazy making than the whole idea of the null hypothesis are these type 1 and type 2 errors. Now remember that our statistical tax tests have a built-in risk factor for making an error. The first type of error is called the type 1 error, and that occurs when we reject the null hypothesis when it is actually true. Typically this happens when we set our risk level too high. Back in the old days, when we used horse-drawn computers, I mean, when we did our statistical calculations on a chalkboard or a pencil and paper, it was very difficult to do the calculations on very large data sets. Never mind type 1 and type 2 errors, one was constantly prone to just human error. So back in those days, in order to avoid human error, we often relied on smaller sample sizes. Also, we did this because the time and expense it would take us to calculate out large data sets, well, unless we had access to a mainframe computer, which few people did. So, say we set our hypothesis level high, and we happen to draw one of those um, samples that only happens nine times in a hundred. Maybe your intervention wasn't really effect effective, but you just happened to have selected people into your research study who were going to get better anyway. Now conversely, a type 2 error is failing to reject the null hypothesis when in fact the results did happen by chance. We can reduce the risk of type 1 error by making our significance level lower setting it to 0 0.01 instead of 0 0.05, but that only erases our risk of committing a type 2 error. The best way to avoid making either 
a type 1 or a type 2 error would be to have a well thought out random selection scheme that is as large as we can feasibly handle. When we do survey research where we can randomly sample a lot of people and easily conduct statistical analysis, <clears throat> avoiding these types of errors is fairly easy. However, if you are um, researching a social work intervention that may take 18 months to complete, uh, having a very large um, sample sizes becomes an excessive uh, financial burden on the research team. Oftentimes when students are doing their research projects in the spring semester, they will ask me how large a sample size should they have, and I always respond to the same thing, it depends. Sample size depends on your theory, your resources, uh, there's just no simple answer. 14. <clears throat> Statistical significance is not the all and end all of all of your quantitative analysis. In fact, it's just the first step. The only thing our statistical significance tells us <clears throat> is whether or not the um, results we found happened by chance. Once we have discovered that our findings did not happen by chance, then we need to use some measure of association to determine how strong the relationship is of one variable to another. This strength helps us to predict what effect one variable will have on another. It will help us predict whether our independent variable, which would be the intervention that we have created, truly does have an effect on the dependent variable which would be our desired outcome. Does the client quit drinking? Is the family reunited? Are psychiatric symptoms reduced? Slide 15. The most common measure of association is called the Pearson product moment correlation. What a correlation tells us is the amount of change that happens in variable A that co-occurs co in variable B, for example. But correlation, <clears throat> correlations do not say that a variable A or variable B caused the other to change, but it does say that the change happens in a related way. We will dive deeply into the Pearson product moment correlation next semester. And by understanding it, we'll understand the association of drinking beer to statistics. Something to look forward to anyway. Slide 16. Effect size are yet another of those things that we will be re reviewing in our spring semester in more detail. <clears throat> what an effect size does is let the Researchers know the strength of the association of the two variables. Effect sizes are especially important when you're doing meta-analysis. Slide 17. The standard deviation used in the equation above to calculate Cohen's D is one approach. The pooled standard deviation of two groups combined or an estimate of the standard deviation of the population may be used. When calculating the effect size in this way, the plus or minus sign of the resulting statistic is interpreted according to whether a reduction in the outcome measure represents a desirable or an undesirable effect. A negative sign is used to indicate a negative effect. If an intervention is designed to reduce something, for example, physical abuse incidents, a successful intervention results in a negative number. However, when reporting this finding, the negative sign should be removed. Negative signs are only used for the findings. This formula produces a z-score, which can be interpreted using a z-table. 
and that's probably a lot more than you really wanted to know. We'll be looking at this stuff much, much more closely in the uh, in the spring. Slide 18. <clears throat> odds ratios. An odds ratio is used to calculate the effect size when one is dealing with two variables that are dichotomous. For example, if you had one variable, say they went to alcohol treatment, that is dichotomous, yes and no. A second dichotomous variable, did they quit drinking, yes or no. We would calculate an odds ratio of whether or not attending alcohol or treatment would result in quitting drinking. Slide 19. Risk ratio is quite similar to the odds ratio. And frankly, I don't know that I've ever seen a risk ratio reported in the literature. But maybe I should read more. Ha 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 ha. Slide 20. As price, precise as statistics usually is, it is important to remember that the effect size, like the level of significance and the importance that you read into correlation coefficients, have no hard and fast rule. When you calculate a Cohen's D, an effect size of 0.8 or higher is usually considered a strong effect size. 0.4 all the way up to 0.6 are usually considered medium effects, and from 0.2 to 0.3 is a small effect size, and anything under that is considered meaningless. Slide 21. Well, it looks like there's something new in the 8th edition that was not here in the 7th edition. The number needed to treat is actually a very useful and practical calculation to make. It will tell you how many individuals you will have to provide an intervention to in order to get a single effective outcome. Program administrators, administrators use this kind of tool. Slide 22. Of all the significant standards that we think about in research, it's important not to forget substantive significance. Also called clinical significance, it is not a mathematical procedure, but a qualitative decision made by program planners all the time. Essentially, it is saying the amount of effort we are putting into this intervention is worth the amount of return you're getting out of it in the way of improved client health, for example. So a very costly intervention that saves a life might be clinically, clinically significant even if it is only effective in a relatively few numbers of cases. Whereas a very effective intervention that is also very expensive and treats um, maybe a relatively minor problem may be found to be lacking in clinical or more likely um, substantive uh, significance. And all these qualitative decisions that administrators and the bean counters will have to make using the best evidence they have at their command. So that's the end of, uh, end of part one.